Amen. Y'all can be seated. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 is what I call one of the crucifixion passages in the Old Testament. There are three. Oh, there are many passages that, that have pictures of the crucifixion, like Abraham offering his son Isaac, etc. There, there are many like that. But there are three that specifically use the word pierced. My hands and feet are pierced. They gamble for my clothing. They say he saved others. Let him save himself. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I stare at all of my bones. My bones stare up at me. They're out of joint. And on and on it goes. That's Psalm 22. That's a crucifixion passage. David was taken in the spirit to the foot of the cross 1,000 years before it happened. He heard the words that were being spoken. He saw the hands and feet pierced. He saw the soldiers gambling under the feet of the pierced one. Another one is in Zechariah chapter 12. Very quickly, we'll touch on it this morning and you'll see at a most appropriate place. You're going to love this. And on that day, you will look upon me, says the Lord, whom you have pierced. But you will mourn for him as an only son. And then Zechariah 13 says, And on that day in Jerusalem, a fountain will be opened, and everyone who comes underneath the flow of that fountain will have their sins washed away. Go to Isaiah 53. One of the three crucifixion passages I'm going to skim, just beginning with verse 1. So who's believed our message? Whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a tender shoot, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Look down at the next verse. He was despised. He was rejected by men. Well, see, we're on the other side of the crucifixion. We know what this is about. This is about Jesus. He, a man of sorrows, familiar with sufferings, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we didn't even esteem him. The next verse, surely he took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows, yet we considered him to be stricken by God. You know, the Pharisees thought they were doing God a favor by killing Jesus. They considered him just a heretic, smitten by God. 700 years before the crucifixion, that was prophesied. Keep reading. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the iniquity, the sin of us all. And it goes on and on. He was depressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. That's like before Caiaphas. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. That's out of the Garden of Gethsemane. As a sheep before her shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth like the trial with Caiaphas. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? Because he was cut off from the land of the living, that is, from, the, from this earthly realm. He was only 33 years old. He had no children, no marriage, no nothing. By forth of the transgression of my people, he was stricken. That's what he came to do. That's why he was here as a trap set up to trap Satan, and it worked. God prophesied it in the garden in Genesis 3.15. From the womb of a woman is coming a male child. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head one day. Amen. Isaiah is fleshing it out, the piercing, the beating, the stripes on his back. It's all right here, but wait, you know what else is there? Keep reading. All right? Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. It was God's plan to crush him and to cause him to suffer. He had to do that to take away our sin. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. By the way, that's us. Can I get an amen, church? That's us. And prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand, and the suffering of his soul will see the light of life and be satisfied. Y'all look at me. The resurrection is spoken of there. I mean, if that's not a crucifixion passage, I don't know what is. But you know what's cool? So that passage is hidden. That's, that's, that's the forbidden chapter in Orthodox, Orthodox Judaism. But because of today's technology, so many people, lost folks, Muslims, Jews, you know, folks from around the world, doesn't matter what you are, they're seeing it. 
They're seeing the stuff that I preached last Sunday. They're seeing the stuff that I'm going to show you this morning. They're seeing passages like this. It's coming alive. They're like the Hebrews on the street that receive it thinking it's a Chinese restaurant. And all they have to do is read it. The Word of God is alive. Amen, church? It's alive. Pierces the heart, the bone, the marrow. All they have to do is see it. So Isaiah 53 is that, but what I love is there are portions of Isaiah 52 that are also forbidden. When they go through their lectionaries in the synagogues, they will read through the book of Isaiah. When they get to chapter 52 and 53, they skip chapter 53 altogether and skip portions of uh, chapter 52. But they don't say that to the congregants. They just keep reading. And to the congregants that never have their hands on a scroll or a book or a, what we would call an Old Testament, a Tanakh in Hebrew, they don't know it's there. I love teasing Christians about that because Christians sometimes can get all self-righteous and say, how come they don't know what's in their own Bibles? <laughs> so you know the answer. Because a lot of people who call themselves God's people don't even read God's Word. And that's for Christians too. I want you to look at Isaiah 52. I'm going to pick one verse out. It's not out of context because it all sets it up. It sets everything up. But Isaiah 52 is profound. And the Lord, that's all capital, L-O-R-D, which means Yahweh. Yahweh will lay bare his holy arm. Something about his bare arms. Yahweh himself. In the sight of all the nations and of all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And then Isaiah 53 tells us how it all comes about. But listen to me. Church family, you know this. Probably a lot of our guests know this. I'm not talking down to anybody that doesn't know it because most Christians don't know it or didn't know it until maybe recently. But anytime you see the word salvation in the Old Testament, that's the English. The Hebrew word there is literally Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. Coming through the Latin to the Greek to the English, it winds up as Jesus. All the world will see the Jesus of our God when God lays bare his holy arms. All the nations will see it. And then Isaiah 53 spells out the details. Is everybody with me? Now, remember, for those of you that were here last week, some of this is a little bit of a review, but I will do it quickly. But I want our guests to be able to latch on to this just like you did last week and just like many, many, many thousands around the world are doing now. All right, so, uh, so Isaiah 52.10, we just read that, and Isaiah 53, we skimmed it. And I'm showing you shocking hidden connection. Hidden. Sometimes people get upset about it. God doesn't hide anything. Oh, contraire. <laughs> All through the New Testament, they talk about the mystery that was hidden in God, hidden in Christ, hidden at the throne, hidden from the beginning, but now revealed by the Holy Spirit, now revealed by the church. All through the Old Testament, God says he delights in, and I'm just going to paraphrase this, but hiding things from his children until the time is right, then he reveals them. And he even says in one verse, he says, I do this so that you can never say, I knew that before I showed it to you. Isn't that amazing? You're going to see some of that right here today. All right, the shocking hidden connection. Go ahead, turn the page. All right, now you'll remember last week, this, this looks like some seminary stuff, and I'm sorry, but it goes quickly, and it's very, very important. All right, here's the deal. The Sinaitic script, the proto-Sinaitic script, that's where all the alphabets basically of the world came from. It came out of the, that, that area, the Middle East. Uh, but prior to that, there were hieroglyphics. I told you this last week. You know, um, uh, symbols, pictures. But those pictures represented whole words or whole concepts. But never before that did they have, was there, we don't know, anywhere on the planet and any archaeological discovery of an actual alphabet where individual letters had individual sounds. That way you could put together, you could make up new words. New concepts. Now poetry and literature would come alive instead of just basic communication through, through a written pictures to, to express concepts. 2,000 years B.C. is what 
we go back to the earliest finds we have. It may have gone back before then, so that's over 4,000 years ago. We also know that out of that came all the Semitic languages, which would include Hebrew. And out of those came even the Greek language, and out of the Greek language came most of the English language. So our language traces all the way back. As you can see down here in the bottom, I see the graphs in this color match, Proto-Sinatic, Paleo-Hebrew, Modern Hebrew. What I've done, I've taken the first and last letter of the alphabets. You can see the first letter of the Proto-Sinatic was Aleph, and the last letter is Ta. That's the same in Modern Hebrew. That matches to Alpha and Omega, the Aleph, the Ta, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We get to the book of Revelation. We hear Jesus call himself that. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Of course, it's written in Greek, so that's what it says. But if he spoke it in Hebrew, he would have been saying, I am the Aleph and the Ta. I am the first, I am the last, I am the beginning, I am the end. I hold the keys to everything. I created everything, amen? And he's standing in the midst of the candlesticks, Revelation 1. You remember all that? Everybody with me? Okay. All right. So, but look at the pictures. Aren't they amazing? Especially you, your eyes have already seen, let me see, the cross. You can't hardly miss that. So, so for, for thousands of years... This meant God. See, and each letter, when they devised the letters, each letter had a meaning to it. Now, I'm going to get into this deeper and prove that to you. There's this thing now going around the Internet, even from people with doctor's degrees, saying, oh, that's not true. That never happened. They're crazy. They're out of their minds. And I'll show you some of the most modern scholarship on it from right in front of their face. You'll see in just a moment. But it, don't, don't listen to them. They're wrong. I'm just telling you. Seldom do I stand in this pulpit and call somebody else wrong like that when it comes to biblical stuff, but they are wrong. And all the way back to the proto synatic we knew that the first letter represented the name of God or God. In fact, you know how you pronounced it? We call it Aleph, but it gave the sound El, 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 El Shaddai, El, God, El Adonai. Okay, so that's where it came from. So they would have the first letter. The last letter, Tav, of course, we see it in the shape of a crucifixion cross. But they didn't know. This was thousands of years before Jesus would come to the cross. Even in the, the crucifixion scriptures, we said they pierced his hands and his feet. Crucifixion wasn't invented when those things were written. They, they, the Persians basically invented that, and then the Romans really perfected it. So, but there it was all along. And so what Aleph and the Ta means, because each letter had a meaning. It's Okay, look, if I'm texting you today and you go on and you say stuff, 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 maybe it's kind of nasty towards me, and I respond with the letter K. What have I just said? I've said a mouthful, haven't I? I've said, okay, if that's how you feel. All right, whatever you say, one letter means something. Does that make sense? And so then the Paleo-Hebrew, that's interesting because that was the original alphabet of the Old Testament. So you can see how it evolved from that to that. Still looks similar, but it looks like a stick figure of that, if you will. This is exactly the same, except it's turned on its side. I'm going to show you an actual Paleo-Hebrew inscription on a, on a rock inscription from a world-renowned archaeologist that discovered it's the oldest known form of Paleo-Hebrew discovered, and you will see that very sign, so you'll know that I'm not telling you a fib. I would never stand here and do that, but, you know, it helps if you can see it because if you try to tell other people about this that don't know it, they think you're crazy, they think I'm crazy, and they think you're crazy from coming and listening to this sermon. So I want you to walk out of here in your heart knowing that what you're seeing and going to see is the truth, Okay. And then, of course, it eventually evolved into what's now modern Hebrew, Aleph and Tal. Now, take a look at those letters because I'm going to be showing you a lot of scriptures in modern Hebrew. And then I may do some drop downs and show you the Aleph and the Tal. And then that way you'll know what you're looking at. But what you're looking at, what the Hebrew would have seen in their scriptures was this. And what they would have known down through the generations was this. And this means each had a meaning. That means God. This means the sign. God who became the sign to the world. What does Hebrews, what does Isaiah 52, 10 say? And on that day, he will bear, God, Yahweh, will bear his holy arms so that all the world will see. That's a sign. And will see the salvation, the Yeshua of our God. All the nations will see. Basically, that whole verse is an Aleph Tal message. God, who himself became the sign.
Aleph Ta, Alpha Omega, Isaiah 41, 44, and 48. Um, In those three places, God, Yahweh, calls himself the Aleph Ta. He says, I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. Then we get to the New Testament. We hear Jesus himself say, I am the Alpha, the Omega. I am the Aleph Ta. I am the first. I am the last, the beginning and the end. Okay, so we're all in agreement on that, that the Bible says that, okay? And now down here, I'm telling you what archaeology says, and I will prove it to you in just a moment. There's a picture of it. Do you see I've got it blown up here? There's the Tav. That's right off this rock. There's the the Tav. It's a cross, a crucifixion cross turned sideways. There's the Aleph. I didn't blow it up, but you can, if you can see it with your eyes or... You know, you can see the Aleph right there. And this, what it is, it is a, um, it's an inscription about the building of uh, Hezekiah's tunnel. And it dates to the 8th century, 800 years before Christ. And it demonstrates one of the oldest examples of ancient Paleo-Hebrew. That means that's what the Bible was written. That's what it looked like. And this is from this internationally renowned biblical archaeologist and author, Ph.D., uh, Dr. David Graves. And there's his website and uh, he took a picture of that, and I'm the one that put the red and yellow circles so that you could see exactly where they were. I just want you to know that I'm telling you the truth. I have always been telling the truth, but I found this, and I said, i got to bring this. they got to see this. Okay, turn the page. Okay, so now, where is the first Aleph and the Ta together, combined together? It's in Genesis 1. All right, we preached on this last week. I'll, I'll, I'll skim back over it because I know some who are here Um, might be thinking, well, I know what that is. That's a grammar marker in the Hebrew, if you've ever had Hebrew. Yes, it is, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. But what I want you to see now is the first instance of a standalone Aleph Ta. And I say standalone because sometimes the Aleph Ta is used in other words. Just like it's like the A and the Z, all right? If if I talked about the Azor Mountains, guess what I would use in English? (laughs) <laughs> the A and the Z, okay? So those, were, those letters would be there. So that's, that's not so profound. But when you find it standing alone by itself, here's what's profound about it. In the English, it has no meaning. In the English, it has no, no significance. We don't know what it is. Therefore, when we come to Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And remember, Hebrew reads from the right to the left, Okay, from the right to the left. In the beginning, created Elohim, or Elohim created, and Elohim means God, and there's another whole teaching on that, good gracious. In the beginning, Elohim created the, the heavens and the earth, but that is left out. It's pronounced in Hebrew as et, et. Sometimes it's spelled E-T-H, but the pronunciation is et. The Aleph Ta, it's just right in the middle. Now, Go ahead and, and and by the way, in the paleo, it would look like that. That's what it would look like in Genesis 1-1 in the Old Testament, the Aleph and the Ta. Does everybody see that? Okay, turn the page. I promise it's going to get a lot more exciting in a moment. I'm just building the foundation. This is a little uh, scholastic, but you need to know this. So why why is the Aleph Ta there? In every English translation, you don't see the Aleph Ta. You just see, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What it would say if they put it in the English translation was, in the beginning, God created at the heavens and the earth. <laughs> okay? You say, what does that mean? And we'd say in English, it means nothing because it's a grammar marker. But here's the problem. The Aleph and the Ta is found 11,000 times in the Old Testament. There's like 980 pages in the Old Testament. So that's like 10 times per page on average, we find a standalone Aleph Ta. It's amazing. It's all through the Old Testament. And the problem is, even those who speak Hebrew that are Orthodox Hebrews, who are PhD Hebrews, who teach Hebrews to, to other people, admit, and I've got all this referenced in my book, Yeshua Protocol, but they admit that out of the 11,000 times it's found in the Old Testament, there are thousands of times they don't have a clue what it means because it doesn't appear to be a grammar marker. Now, the first time we see it in Genesis 1, it is a grammar marker. It's called the accusative case grammar marker or pointer. It points the verb created to the outcome of the verb, the heavens and the earth. Does that make sense? We don't have anything like that in English. We don't need it because the way our words and our verbs and our, and our objects of verbs are arranged in a sentence, we don't need a grammar marker. 
you would think, well, you don't need it there either. That's because you're reading it in English, okay? But if you were reading it in Hebrew, you would need a grammar marker in a lot of cases. The very first verse has that grammar marker. Now, that's important because even the, even the Orthodox Hebrews of today who teach Hebrew as a language, who know that there are thousands of times it appears in a sentence that is not a grammar marker. It, doesn't, it does not point the verb to that, and they don't know what it is. It's there. They say that it must also have a, this is their words, a mystical meaning. We would use the word spiritual probably. It must also have a spiritual meaning. I'm here to tell you it does. I can prove it out of the Bible. Listen to me. This is profound. Jesus said, I am the Aleph and the Ta. Enough said? Jesus said, I am the Aleph and the Ta. God himself in the Old Testament, I am the first and the last. That's what he's talking about, the first and the last. But God uses that of himself, and Jesus punctuates it and uses it of himself. And the first time we see it is in Genesis 1.1. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, turn the page. Now, I told you Yeshua, it literally means salvation. Yeshua HaMashiach is Hebrew for Jesus the Christ or the Messiah. He's the one that says, I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega, the Aleph and the Ta. He's the one that the Bible says in Revelation 13 and in, in 1 Peter chapter 1 that he was uh, created, he was uh, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So in other words, the crucifixion was no accident. It was the plan all along. Is everybody with me? But now here's how you spell Yeshua in Hebrew. I've got it up here in English for you know how those letters are pronounced. Now this is going to be very important as we move forward. Yod, Shin. Wa or Vav, remember I told you that, depending upon what part of the nation you're from. Ayin. Wat Shin Vav Ayin. Okay? I'll show you why this is important in a minute. Turn the page. Now, Psalm 22 is what I hit last week. I'm going to use this as an example very quickly. So, and I've already kind of quoted and showed you how Psalm 22, it's all about the crucifixion. And it was written 1,000 years before. And the Bible even says that the centurion, seeing how he died and hearing what he said, cried out, surely this is the Son of God. He had a good idea what was going on here. What Jesus was doing when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting the first sentence of Psalm 22. He was doing that because a good rabbi would always quote the first verse of a passage he was pointing to. He was a rabbi at that point, a teacher, saying, go look at what we would call, go look at Psalm 22. Read every word. You'll hear the words you're saying. You'll see your soldiers gambling under my feet. You'll see my hands and feet pierced. You'll see my bones out of joint. You'll watch me suffering. You'll see my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth. That was written 1,000 years ago. How did that get there? That's what he's saying. But I'm going to show you what we found out last week. Not only does it say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and hearing the words of my groaning? In Hebrew, there's something hidden there that you don't see. You cannot see it unless you speak Hebrew for a language and unless you look very closely. Turn the page. The name of Jesus is in the first verse. Yod, Yod, Shin, Wa, Ayin. And it's in the word. It's in the middle of a word. I've told you this last week. Sometimes we have a big long word, and in the middle of it, like an anagram, we see another English word right in the middle of it. And you say, oh, wow, that's cool. It doesn't really mean anything except that there's a word in a word, and that whole word means something other than the word that's in the word. Why are you so far from helping me? Right in the middle of it is Yeshua. He was saying, Go turn to Psalm 22. You will see everything that's happening to me. It was written 1,000 years ago. And by quoting that verse, he was also saying, and my signature's on it. My name is in it. In the words I'm speaking, my name is there. We learned all that last week. Turn the page. Then I compared it to Genesis 1. All of a sudden, we discover 
There's Jesus, the elephant and the tall. There are exactly three talls in Genesis 1. It paints a picture of Golgotha. The one in the middle is Jesus. We come to Psalm 22 last week. Three talls out of that whole sentence, there are only three. And the one in the middle is attached to the name of Jesus. Another picture of Golgotha. From the beginning, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Genesis 1.1 tells us about the foundation of the world. And in it is a picture of Golgotha and three crosses and Jesus, the one in the middle. From the cross, he quoted Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't mad at God. He wasn't turning his back on God. I kept reading Psalm 22, and you saw where it says, and God did not turn his back on his anointed. He did not forsake his blessed one. Says it right there in Psalm 22. Has nothing to do with God turning his back. Jesus was just quoting the first verse because it's a compound prophecy. I told you that. But the first several verses are about David. He's the one that wrote it. And then in the midst of that, he's taken up, he's shown stuff that never happened to him. He never had his hands and feet pierced. He never had people gambling for his clothing under his feet. He never had them say those things and do those things. He never cried out, I thirst. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. None of that. And then the chapter 22 goes on to say, like Isaiah 53, but in different words, that he will be dead, but he will live again, and he will rule the nations. That's, that's not David. That's Jesus. And so he quotes it. Then we go all the way back to Genesis 1-1 and we see that it matches the same pattern of picture that's put right before our eyes. Are y'all hearing this? These are the days we live in. There's not another piece of literature in the world that can do that, that declares messages that are unbelievable. In the beginning, God created, and then, oh, and by the way, a thousand years before it happens, let me tell you about this dude that's going to be crucified on the cross and, and all this stuff, and y'all are going to say this, and you're going to say that, and that's the Savior, that's the Messiah, uh, but don't worry about it. And, and it just, to say those things is one thing. For it all to come, come to pass and, and to be proven scientifically even about the creation and then, and then for the crucifixion to take place and the resurrection to take place, that's another thing. But then to go to the original Hebrew that it was written in and to see the images with your own eyes that are right there and to see the words that are embedded within the words pointing to the Aleph and the Ta, the Alpha, the Omega, Yeshua, who is our salvation, Yahweh, who is the Lord. The two are one, the one are two. I know somebody here might be saying, the two are one. What are you talking about? Let me just quote a guy. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Enough said? Do you see what you see? That was last week's message. All right, move along. Turn the page. Thank you. I also told you last week that in Genesis 1-1, there was also a picture of Revelation 1. He said, I saw seven lampstands. We find out those are the churches. And Jesus was standing in the middle of them. Of course, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, and in the temple, they had a seven-pronged a seven -pronged lampstand that in the holy place. Not the holy of holies, but the holy place that represented the presence of God, the light of God, the guidance of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It represents the word of God that would come. Seven represents perfection. There it is. Turn the page. Look at Genesis 1. The three crosses, Golgotha. There are seven words, and in the middle is Jesus. A perfect picture of a seven-pronged lampstand. I told you this last week, but I didn't have that graphic. I wanted you to see it. Both of those are there. Guys, don't answer out loud, but ask yourself, how'd that get there? How did these pictures get there formed by words and letters and thousands of years old? Two languages, Hebrew, Greek, and not just Hebrew, but Paleo-Hebrew, ancient Hebrew. Aleph, ta, the Aleph, el, the ox head, ta, the shape of a crucifixion cross. How can that be? All right, turn the page. 
Now, let's go to the word term Yahweh. I, this is important to know. I touched on this last week, but I didn't give you the, all the proof. I just touched on it because I've preached on it before. But the bottom line, there, there, there's how you spell Yahweh. yud he wah he yud he wah he It almost sounds like Yahweh, doesn't it? yod he wah he yah he wah he Yahweh. Okay? He also calls himself the Owl of Ta, as Jesus does. Now, there are people that will say, um, well, that, you know, letter meanings, that's just weird stuff, and only idiots and conspiracy theorists get into that. Well, let me just quote from uh, he, uh, Israel's Haratz News 2013. They're the New York Times of Israel. The title, you can go look at it on the Internet, not while I'm preaching, please, but you can take notes. It's called, In the Beginning, the Origins of the Hebrew Language, from Haaretz. This is a quote. The names and where it's each of and ideas, I put those there just to give it, you know, impetus from the rest of the article, but that's the context. The names of each of the Hebrew letters have meanings or ideas in the Hebrew language. That doesn't actually matter when writing or reading, but it is nice to know. It's like if you're reading a word, like the word no, K-N-O-W, you also see that K, and you know you can use that as a text word, and it means something totally different. So it doesn't mean anything when you write the word no. But it's nice to know if you want to tell somebody off or either just agree with them, you can just take the letter K and stick it in your text and send it, right? That's what Horatz is saying about the Hebrew language. Yes, each letter has a meaning. Some of them are rather lengthy. He says it doesn't matter if you're reading it or writing, though. He says it's just nice to know in case you won't text somebody, <laughs> Right? Is everybody with me? Okay, so the people that say it doesn't exist, they're, they're wrong. I mean, they're just wrong, all right? And then to prove it, millions and millions and millions of mezuzahs are all over the world among the Jews. It's a little prayer box with the scriptures of Deuteronomy 6 that are tacked to the doorframe of their, ho of their house or their um, store, and it's a prayer box. It says, Hero Israel, the Lord thy Lord, the Lord thy God is one God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and there are blessings attached to it. But there's always the letter Sheen on it. it. Looks like our W, but it's a Sheen. Okay? What does that stand for? Well, it stands for the S sound or the SH sound. Sometimes it could be Sin or Sheen, depending upon the vowel points. But it is a letter and it's got a sound, but guess what? It has a meaning. And the meaning and the reason it's on the mezuzah is because it stands for Shaddai. Shaddai. It's another one letter that can represent a name of God. El Shaddai. The Almighty God is protecting this house. The Almighty God is protecting this business. The Almighty God protects His Word. There is one God. Hear, O Israel, there is one God. Are you following me? If letters don't have meanings, why are they on the mezuzahs? I'm just making this point because I, I don't want anybody to get in your face one day when you try to tell them about this and they say, oh, your preacher's stupid, your church is stupid, they don't know. No, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay. The other thing I'm going to do when you see the letter meaning of yod he wah -Heh and Yeshua, um, kabad.org. Now, this is the oldest and largest Orthodox Jewish internet site, okay? But they have all of the letters and all of the meanings and all the history behind them. And then HebrewToday.com, not quite as orthodox. It's used by schools, public and private, all over Israel and news sources to teach Hebrew to people all over the world. It's a learning. They also have a whole section where every letter is defined and the history is given and the meaning of it, the meaning of the letter, like K. If it was on an English side, it would have K, and it's this, uh, this number of the alphabet, and, and it has the K sound, etc. And then it might have a little side note and say, but if you use it alone in a text, it means okay, or I hear you, or, you know, if, if, if the note's kind of curt and you want to send back a curt response, it has a more curt meaning, like, okay, if you say so, if you say so, K. So that's how they do. So, so you've got these two sites that say all of that. It's on the mezuzah. Harach wrote about it, so what I'm getting ready to show you now, you can trust. Okay. So what is the meaning of those letters? Turn the page. Most of you know this. I've taught it before. The yod means the hand. He means behold. The wa means the nail or the spear. He means behold. Behold the hand. Behold the nail. Or behold the spears. The spear, excuse me. How'd that get there? 
Yahweh is found 7,000 times in the Old Testament. No Orthodox Jew would have invented letters that would make his name speak of the cross and of Jesus. Way back then, they could have asked God, what is your name? What does it mean? What did he tell, what did he tell Moses when Moses asked? He said, I am who I am. You know what that's a derivative of? yud heh Except it just comes out in that particular derivative as I am who I am. Okay, because if he had said to him, what it means is behold the hands, behold the nails, Moses wouldn't have had a clue and nobody else would for 2,000 more years. But when it happened, we look at the crucifixion. We look at Genesis 1 with a picture of Golgotha. We look at Psalm 22 with a picture of Golgotha and we see it, the hands, the nails, the Lord bearing his arm before the nations to show us the Yeshua of his salvation. It's been there for thousands of years. No other piece of literature in the world has anything like this. Turn the page. So now let's go to Yeshua. What are the letter meanings of Yeshua? You notice the Yod and the Wa. That's in the name of Yahweh. Two letters that are not the Sheen. We already know what that means, don't we? It's on the mezuzah. El Shaddai. Ayin. What does that mean? Turn the page. El Shaddai, whose hands are pierced by the nail and the spear, it's so that we can see salvation. Ayin literally means to see, and then in these sites it says specifically the salvation of God. Again, they don't have a clue. They just know what the letters mean. Now, a lot of them are beginning to find this stuff out that I'm teaching and preaching and some others have found, and now they're, they're shutting down. That's where this whole thing came up of don't speak the name of God, don't write the name of God. There's nowhere in the Scriptures that tells us not to speak the name of God. We're told to speak His name, praise His name, sing His name, share His name, preach His name. Yet the Orthodox to this day, and I love the Orthodox Jews and I love Israel, you know, and our best friend in the whole world is, is one who's now a believer in Jesus, lives in Tel Aviv. I'm not trashing anybody. I'm just speaking the truth. The whole reason that the name, and there, there are Christians in America thinking that somehow they're closer to God if they don't speak his name. It's, but you can see Satan's hand in this, guys. And I'm not saying people are demon possessed if they don't say his name. I'm just saying his name is meant to be praised. It's meant to be sung. It's meant to be spoken. It's meant to be shared. It's meant to be preached. It's meant to be teached. You're also supposed to know the letter meanings of it. But if you don't speak it, then nobody will ever teach you because you won't care. You won't know because you're thinking that you're holy because you're not speaking his name. When as a matter of fact, if you spoke it, you might look into it and you would see that. El Shaddai whose hands are pierced by nails, whose body was pierced by a spear, so we could see the salvation of God. Do you see the connection between Yahweh now and El Shaddai? It's crazy. They both basically mean the same thing, except Yahweh's at the head of it saying, behold the hands, behold the nails, then you'll know who I am. But then Yeshua's name means, and here I am, El Shaddai in the flesh, taking the nails in the hands so that you can see the salvation that Yahweh spoke of. Is everybody with me? All right, turn the page. Now, let's get back to where we were. This won't take long because we're almost to a conclusion, but you're going to want to see this. That's the verse I keyed in on. We know it's connected to Isaiah 53 in the English the Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth, and all will see the salvation of our God. As I said, that basically, you can take Aleph Ta, and that's what that says. God, who gave us the sign by going to the cross himself. The ox head and the cross. Aleph and the Ta. Jesus said, that's me. I am the Aleph and the Ta. God says, that's me. I am the first and the last. Three times, I like that number three. I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. Jesus in the last book, in the first chapter says, I am the elephant in the talk, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I was dead, but now I'm alive. 
Go read Isaiah 53. Go read Psalm 22. Are you following me? How did all that get there? And how did it just accidentally tie together over 4,000 years with 50 different authors living under four or five different empires coming together? You're holding it in your hands today, and everything I'm teaching you is in that book and no other place in the world. Turn the page. There's Isaiah 52. And like Psalm 22, Jesus' name is buried right in the middle of it. Yahweh's name is right open. But it gets way better. But what we got here, when you mix these two words together, the nails in the hands of the Almighty God will cause the nations to see Yeshua, our salvation, brought to us by God himself. It all ties together. Not only in words, but in letters and in pictures. But it gets much better. Are you all ready? Turn the page. Here it is again, and we find exactly three toffs. What are the chances of that? And the one in the middle. Jesus' name is attached to it. Again, a picture of Golgotha. So what we have is the Aleph Toth, that means God who goes to the cross as a sign. Yahweh, behold the hands, behold the nails, and behold the spear. Yeshua, El Shaddai, who takes the nails in his hands so we can see God's salvation. All of those together. Isaiah 52 says it in words. And then we find a picture of Yahweh, who is the Aleph Ta. Here's the word that becomes flesh. Yeshua, who is also the Aleph Ta. And in this whole verse... There are only three Tas, and the one in the middle is Yeshua, who came in flesh to take it upon himself for us. Do you see? How is this happening? How is this happening? I told you in this book, Yeshua Protocol, I've got 45 illustrations. You only see in... You know, I've put a bunch in these PowerPoints to explain the illustrations, but you don't, you've only seen three or four illustrations in the last two Sundays. This stuff is everywhere, guys. In the Word, in science, in archaeology and geology, and we're just now finding most of this. But we're finding it in a time in your generation where there's instantaneous communication information systems that have never been known to the world before. I know most of you grew up with it. I know if I need my cell phone worked on, I take it to my three-year-old grandson. And he can make it work. You guys grew up with it. So you take it for granted. Most people do. I mean, even I do. I'm an old guy. When I, you know, when I came to pastor here, I was 30 years old. But we didn't, uh, we didn't have any of that. We didn't even have pagers back then. So we've, I've watched all this come about. What I'm saying is a lot of this that I'm showing you is just, and that's in this book, has just now being discovered. Some of it, well, this is, it's always been there. And there have been some people who have found these pictures and stuff, but they've not been able to share it. To them. Now I can preach it up here in a little church. I preach it. It goes live stream. Then we take segments of it. We put it on five different video platforms. It goes all over the world. Before long, millions around the world are sharing it. And then they're sharing it and sharing it and sharing it with people all over the world. And now the whole world is seeing these pictures, these scriptures, the connections between them all. And it all goes back to Genesis 1. Turn the page. Here's Isaiah 52. Here's Yeshua in the middle. Also, there's one here. So you say, well, Yahweh, yeah, of course, he's the Lord God. Watch. He's the Lord God who makes it all happen. You're going to put the hands and nails in his, you're going to put the nails in his hands for sure. But then it's going to be lived out in the flesh in our realm. And there's the Aleph Ta. Here's the Yahweh who is the Aleph Ta. Here's Yeshua who is the Aleph Ta. Now he's on the middle cross. His name is even attached to the cross. His name is in there. Yahweh's name is there. 
an Aleph Ta associated with Yahweh, an Aleph Ta associated with Yeshua, and exactly three Ta's in the Paleo-Hebrew, three crosses, Jesus in the middle. We come back to Genesis 1-1, Elohim. That's another whole study. I'll do it with the church some other Sunday morning with the letter meanings and all, but it's just as powerful as all these others. But we're talking, our tra English translations say, in the beginning, God, because Elohim translates to God in English. But that means it's Yahweh. That means that's the Aleph Ta. And right next to it is the first Aleph Ta we find. And there's three crosses, and the Aleph Ta is in the middle. Are you with me so far? We're almost done. Go back. There's something I've got to show you. I, I might have missed it. Go, go back one slide. There, right there. All right, so I, I have Zechariah 12 there. But watch, watch this. Look how it reads. He, I'm, I'm going to quote it. On that day, you will look upon me, whom you have pierced, but you will mourn for him as an only son. Okay, now, now you know what's there? An Aleph Ta and three crosses. I, you'll see it later. It's just crazy, but watch this. This Isaiah 52.10, watch this. On that day... You will look upon me, whom you have pierced, but you will mourn for him as an only son. Do you see? Go back to the last slide. It's all about us. Every one of them is a Golgotha scene. Every one of them magnifies Jesus' name and or the name of the Lord Yahweh, who is Jesus in the flesh. Every one of them. And they're being shown to your eyes and to the eyes of the world. We are seeing he's laying bare his arms before the nations and the worlds right now. He's laying bare his arms before the demonic realm and the angelic realm. He's laying bare his arms in a time when the world is in upheaval and turmoil, when for the first time since the birth of the church, governments of the world got together with one voice and told the church to shut its doors and to quit singing. And we'll tell you when you can come back and how many can come and if you can sing again and how far you have to sit from each other and if we let you. And if you don't obey us, Chicago mayor said, we'll bulldoze your church, California and Florida. Florida, the, the local authorities put pastors in jail. You, for the first time in history, the whole globe spoke with one voice, shut the church down and quit this singing. These are the times we live in. And in those times, this stuff is now going to the world so that everybody can see. Why do I say it's all about you? There's another picture here. You've heard this preached many times, and you went, oh, that's so cool. That's so cool, yes. But now it's in Genesis 1. You see it. Now it's in Isaiah 52. You see it. It's in Isaiah 53. I promise you, you'll see it. It's in Zechariah 12. You'll see it. It's in Psalm 22. You'll see it. What am I talking about? Three crosses. Three crosses. Three crosses. Jesus in the middle. Jesus in the middle. Jesus in the middle. The name of Jesus in the verses he quotes. Hidden. And in each one of them, three crosses. What happened on Calvary? Jesus was the man in the middle. Who were on both sides? Two thieves. You know what we all are? Thieves, murderers, and liars. One way or the other. We've broken every commandment. Jesus said, if you want to kill somebody in your heart, you're a murderer. <laughs> See, because God looks on the heart. Do you understand? Those two thieves are us. One of them drew his last breath in rejection of Jesus. Jesus, the Bible doesn't, he didn't even speak to the guy after that. I'm, you, you never hear it. But one of them, who was just like the other one, stood up for Jesus and said, wait a minute, we deserve what we're getting. He doesn't. And then he looked at him and he said, Lord, that's Adonai. He's confessing him with his mouth. Adonai, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now he's acknowledging this is God in the flesh. Jesus looked at him. The Bible doesn't say it, but I believe with all my heart, Jesus smiled at the guy. Today, you will be with me in paradise, and I'm telling you the truth. You will be with me in paradise. See, that's what this picture is about. God looks down upon 8 billion people. He sees only two 
kinds of people. He doesn't see black people, yellow people, white people, brown people. He doesn't see male, female. He doesn't see short, tall. He doesn't see skinny or not so skinny. He sees two kinds of people. Those that reject this. Pictures. The mountains and the valley. Your DNA. The, 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 the subatomic level uh, watermarks. They're there. They're there. They're everywhere. His name, his name, his name. There's no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. At that name, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. That name, that name. Not Muhammad, not Allah, not uh, Joseph Smith, not Buddha, not the Hindu Vedas and the, and the writers, not, not Nostradamus, not the astrology charts, not that name, that name, that name. There's no other book like this word of God. There's no other literature on the planet like it. And it all points to Jesus, the one in the middle. And you give the Lord Jesus a hand. And you, you and I, every soul here, and I'm not here to judge anybody. Some of you I've known for years, and I believe that you're believers, and, I, and because you, you speak it and you live it, but I still can't pronounce that on you. That's between you and the Lord in the final analysis. And even people here who don't, maybe you're a little shy or maybe you don't even belong to the Lord, that's not my judgment. All, my, what I'm supposed to do is do this right here, to preach, to teach, to sow the seed, to beg, to plead, to show you how you can come. Because I'm telling you, you are one of those thieves on that on either side of that cross. Why do you think God puts those pictures all through? And by the way, they're not just anywhere. You don't find the Aleph Tal in every perfect location. You don't find three crosses just wherever. Those are, those are three Zs. How many times do you run across a sentence that has three Zs in it? Do you understand what I'm saying? And the one in the middle is always Yeshua by his name. How can that be? It's because we're living in the last days. Whatever that means, I don't know dates. I just know we're in prophetic times. God is speaking. Nobody will be without account. You're one of the thieves. Today you get to choose which one you want to be. It's as simple as that. Let's have a word of prayer together.